An occasion such as this almost demands that I provide a statement of vision for writing programs at Arizona State University. As a value proposition, such a statement would, one, communicate a plan moving forward, two, draw us together under a common purpose, and three, create an opportunity to brand our program for outside observers. These all sound like appealing benefits, to be sure, but as I have thought about our work together, I keep uh, getting hung up on where the burden of credit falls in such a genre. There is something built into vision statements that encourages we grant sole credit to the administrator who, by some kind of strange magic, peers into the future and makes it real. However valuable vision statements are to programs, universities, and private businesses, I believe that statements of habit are even more so. Instead of projecting into an unknown future, statements of habit work on the granule, granular workaday conditions that shape the lived experiences of our professional lives. Habits are formed and unformed by patterns of deliberate practice. We choose our habits, we come to be known by them for better or worse, and at various points we become accountable to them. There are, five fun, or there are three fundamental habits that I would like to be characteristic of writing programs at ASU. The first is that we're actively searching for strengths. The second is that we're actively connecting outwards. And the third is that we're actively and constantly revising as a group. In my brief address this morning, I'd like to define what I mean by each of these habits and discuss the steps that I will initiate to support them as we grow together. At the end of my address, I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have moving forward. The first habit is, search, is working from and searching for strengths. Searching for strengths responds to the problems of deficit-based thinking, which tend to compromise our capacity to learn from one another. If, for example, we believe that a student cannot learn a difficult concept, we communicate to them that there is a lack or a deficiency in their capacities as learners, which not only prevents them from learning the difficult concept, but compromises their sense of self-worth. Four assumptions define the habit of searching for strengths. The first, you possess strengths, and thus has something meaningful to contribute to our program. Second, your students and colleagues possess strengths, and thus have something meaningful to contribute to our program. Third, Together, we must find a way of negotiating a mutually beneficial outcome that grows one another's strengths. And fourth, it involves a problem-solution mindset, by which I mean you view professional complications and or challenges as an opportunity to utilize your strengths in order to solve the problem or complication effectively. When we choose to work from the strengths our students and colleagues possess, we get in the habit of listening for the reasonability of their arguments. We make a conscious choice to assume that there is something of value that is worth recognizing and building upon. And we instill in them the confidence to take risks in their learning because they know they have been recognized as having value. Working from strengths does not mean you cannot disagree with an argument, recommendation, or decision. Assuming that the person is working from their strengths does not mean you have to be persuaded by the outcomes of such work, but it does mean that all perspectives deserve a hearing. So what I'd like for you to do is take a moment, and on the note card that's attached to that handout, I want you to identify a strength that you possess that you wish more people knew about. Not a secret talent per se, but something that is connected to a sense of purpose and motivates how you interact with others. So after you filled out your note card, um, I want you to, if you feel comfortable sharing it with me, will you submit it to me at the end of the talk or we'll collect it um, at some point at the end or you can drop it by my office. Okay, if you don't feel comfortable with it, put it in your pocket and walk away. Uh, at least you will have identified something that you do really well. Okay. So one of the things we're going to do to support this professional habit of searching for strengths is I'm going to ask you to fill out a Clifton Strengths Assessment Survey, which I will provide to you in the coming weeks. 
The danger in, impl in implementing this kind of uh, assessment survey is that it will feel a little bit like a gimmick. But this is not a personality test, it's a cultural logic. As a program, our culture is defined by the arguments we make, both in how we deliver instruction, how we communicate with one another, and how we imagine a future together. So if we want to work from strengths, we need to know what one another's strengths are. And in future correspondence, correspondences from me, you'll see my top five strengths listed in the signature line. And those are responsibility, strategic, learner, ideation, and achiever. Okay. As a director committed to shared leadership, I need to know where your strengths lie. One problem of directing a program this large is that it will take me some time uh, to get up to speed with everybody. Strengths data will help me learn, recognize, and value what you contribute to our program, and it will also help me better understand where you are coming from when you propose a new idea or register a concern. So this is what I mean when I say that it allows us to assume reasonability. It will allow me to hear what you're asking and recommending more effectively. I want to be able to interpret what you are saying from the standpoint of what it will contribute to our program, and strengths will help me do that. Each member of the leadership team will also take and distribute their strengths data to the program so you have a framework for understanding how we orient toward administrative leadership and why we might be inclined toward certain recommendations or decisions. So you'll see that coming through in the next couple of weeks. In addition, once we've completed our strengths surveys, uh, we will provide professional development in the future to help you develop your strengths and support strengths development in others. So, if you find this particularly valuable, this can be a great pedagogical strategy for individualizing student strengths within your class. Okay. We will also engage in an activity called TRIOs, and that's the second handout that you have there next to the note card. TRIOs are formed when a group of three instructors who possess different strengths commit to encouraging one another at least once a month throughout the school year. The key to a trio success is that each member, one, identifies the strengths in their colleagues, two, listens to the ways their colleagues feel most recognized, and three, develops a plan for communicating recognition that is specific to each colleague's strengths and preferences. For some instructors, a special note of recognition puts wind in their sails. For others, a 15-minute conversation after class will do the trick. Regardless, the overarching goal is to create a culture of recognition where everyone takes an active role in supporting their colleagues and raising the overall climate of our work lives. Program cultures do not succeed through the imposition of a normalized vision of how instructors should feel. They succeed when there is a baseline of recognition that is committed to building up strengths in one another. If everyone is in part responsible for the cultural climate of our program, then we are all accountable for creating and maintaining a positive work environment, and TRIOs are designed to help us with this task. As we turn toward the habit of building connections across ASU, I want to mention that our university is committed to identifying and building strengths through its new EDGE professional development program. I actually learned about this this last week. Uh, the program promises to, quote, enable broad access to participation in and tracking of learning opportunities for Arizona State University staff or student employees. The ongoing benefits of ASU's career edge include increased awareness of training opportunities, encouragement of professional development conversations between an employee and manager, and optimizing opportunities throughout the university, saving time and money. So I'll send out an email uh, later this week that provides you um, resources about this edge program, and I encourage you to take advantage of it. Okay. The second habit of mind that I want to encourage is connecting outwards across ASU. Everybody in this room knows this, but writing is, instruction is not an area of study that is specific to English, and the students we teach are often not majoring in English. As a program, we are part of a larger college university, and connecting outwards is a recognition of this fact. One of the ways that we can contribute, or we can communicate the value of writing instruction both to our students and our colleagues across the university is supporting and or partnering with events, departments, and colleges that make writing resources available to us and to our students. Our capacity to form an identity as a program and thus to articulate relevance is not based on who or what we exclude, but by who or what we include. For example, over the last couple of weeks, we have received a number of exciting communications from various leaders that make extraordinary opportunities available to our students and colleagues. 
On April 9, 2020, Colson Whitehead will, vi will visit campus to deliver the Jonathan and Maxine Marshall Distinguished Lecture. This is an extraordinary opportunity to engage with one of the most successful writers working in the US. To support Whitehead's visit, I will be providing excerpts of his writing so that you can incorporate them into your writing programs classes beginning next, sem next semester if you choose to do so. In addition, I'll be creating some small sample assignments that you can incorporate in your class in order to promote the event to students. Obviously, if you have a better idea for an assignment, you should develop it and then share it. Regardless, you are not obligated to use either the readings or the sample assignments. I am asking that you promote the event to students to, in each of your writing program classes. My hope is that the, White, the Whitehead's lecture will be overwhelmingly populated by writing programs, students, and instructors. Another example is the Desert Humanities Initiative, whose goals are to innovate by encouraging bold humanities-led projects that are materially engaged, philosophically nimble, globally visible, multidisciplinary, multidisciplinarily informed, timely, and publicly accessible. It's also designed to intensify by offering a site for convening faculty from across disciplines, giving a home to an ongoing, exciting, inclusive, and forward-thinking conversation among researchers, artists, and thinkers from ASU and those from outside of our university. It's also designed to catalyze by generating innovative learning opportunities for all and always includes ASU students in its endeavor and it's designed to connect by amplifying the impact of faculty research and fostering alliances with research units worldwide. What I like about this project, in addition to its interdisciplinary scope, is that it emphasizes the need to pay attention to the local conditions that expose the most exigent issues that we face as communities in this area. Maybe you already know this, but students are very eager to engage in these conversations as community members. They want to feel as though their writing is relevant to their lived experiences, and I can think of no more relevant issue than addressing how climate change is affecting our present and future in the desert. The third habit is learning to revise collectively. I began with strengths because I believe that you have a considerable amount to offer in terms of expertise and a willingness to invest in the program. In fact, one of the things that I've been consistently heartened by as I've interacted with you in my brief time here so far is the earnestness with which you are trying to pursue initiatives that increase the quality of education that students at ASU receive. I understand that revision will be difficult initially. I'm aware of the structural challenges that we face as a program, and I'm learning more each day about, how, about the, subtle nuance, the subtle nuances that add various complications to the problem. One of the things that I think that we need to uh, think about as we move forward is how do we chart a future together and how do we re imagine revision as a collective activity. Part of my job within this activity is to create the conditions whereby your willingness to contribute to the success of our program becomes possible. This possibility depends in part on our capacity to become a revenue generating program. As Chris mentioned, we need to become an economically productive program, not because generating revenue is a solution to all problems, but because generating revenue allows us to pursue ambitious projects that help us to promote the value of our work to students, to the university, and to the wider public. The only way ambitious projects work is if everyone has a collective stake in the planning, drafting, and revising, and revising the steps that we choose to take together. Revising collectively means that our habits as a program are open to change in light of shifting material circumstances that cannot be predicted ahead of time. In other words, it is a habit of responsiveness that is characterized by focusing on shifting details. Collective, uh, revising collectively also means granting a hearing for proposed changes and being accountable for communicating how decisions are rendered. In other words, it's a habit of recognizing the value of different perspectives and delivering one's own with transparency, integrity, and encouragement. Revising collectively finally means recognizing that change occurs incrementally over a period of time and is guided by direction and purpose. In other words, it's a habit of exhibiting patience and seeking sustainable solutions to problems that demand precision and execution. I can't predict the future. But I can promise you that I will operate at the highest level of integrity 
emphasizing fairness, transparency, and accountability as a standard practice. With equal measure, I will encourage your strengths and celebrate your successes, because I believe in the value of our work together. No one becomes a teacher because they are seeking to become a millionaire. We become teachers because we understand that small, sometimes imperceptible investments in student learning can create a world that we all hope to see. I'm looking forward to seeing what we can all accomplish together. Thank you.